Now, really, this definition is true when it comes to our Christian life, when it comes to our pursuit of God. It really is true. If you separate them, it's incomplete. It's incomplete. The Bible says faith, flow, and work, hustle, go hand in hand. Faith without works is, is dead. But I think, and I want to talk about I want to talk about flow a little bit because I think sometimes we have this tendency to lean into hustle a little too much. Sometimes we can think, man, I need to work harder. Sometimes it's even our preaching. We preach a hustle gospel. Got to wake up earlier. Got to work harder. Got to press in. And what happens is it sort of diminishes our heart for the power of God moving in our life. The Bible says it's not by might, it's not by power, it's not by my might, it's not by my power, it's by the Spirit of God. So I want to talk a little bit more about about flow. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this. God created us. We were created in his image. We were created in the image of God, which means we were created We were created to function best. We function best when we are in a relationship with God. Listen, from the very beginning, you go all the way back to the garden, go all the way back to the very beginning. In the garden, God God and Adam and Eve, and they have this perfect relationship, and they walk with God in the cool of the day, and and, and, and you know the story, they, they, they fell, they, they had a disobedient moment and there was, this, there was this disconnection from God. And really the Bible, the whole Bible is a love story of God, you know, working, working on processes and reaching out to try to bridge that gap between him and us to the point where he gave his very best and he sent Jesus Christ And Jesus came, the Bible says, was born of a virgin, walked this earth. Think about it. He was a man. He walked this same earth that you and I walk today. And he was tempted in every way so that he could relate to our humanity. But he didn't give in to any temptation. And he became the perfect sacrifice for our sin on the cross. Now, through the cross, we have forgiveness because all our sin was put on him on the cross. All our shame. He took it all, and in exchange, he gives us what? Forgiveness. He was raised by the power of God on the third day, and now through the resurrection, we can have a new beginning. The cross represents forgiveness. The resurrection represents a new beginning, and now that gap was bridged by the life of Christ, and now through Christ, we have a relationship with God, and we're reunited, and we're reconnected with him. It's awesome. Come on, we ought to thank God for that. That gap was bridged. Jesus paid the price. There's no more price to pay. Now we have a new beginning. And I was, you know, I was studying last year, toward the end of last year, these two books of the Bible very interesting books, First Chronicles and Second Chronicles. We just read that verse about Hezekiah. And I just encourage you, maybe at some point this year, you know, dive into those books. Very interesting books. It's like, it's kind of like reading Shakespeare. There's all this drama. There's betrayal and, 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 and lust and, you know, wars and family drama. And it's pretty crazy, you know, how God continued to love people his people through all of their different issues. And when you, when you read those two books of the Bible, here's what you see. you see. You see this swinging back and forth. One, one moment they're serving God and they're seeking after the things of God and God is blessing them and God is rewarding their life and they're prospering and they're moving forward. And then, and then they start, it's like they just swing over and they start running after other gods and, 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 and God allows them to be handed over to their enemies and, and there's this war and this battle and they repent and they start seeking God again and then they swing all the way back. How many of you know what I'm talking about? There's this like pendulum swing. And there's this one phrase that's used over and over again in those books to describe what this looks like. It's, 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 it's this phrase right here. It's, they were faithful 
to the Lord. Or when they were swinging over here, they were unfaithful to the Lord. They were faithful to the Lord. They were unfaithful to the Lord. So I started doing a little thinking and digging and I studied. I unpacked these books. I love to teach. I love to explore the the Word of God. And I think practically, I, I, I see that phrase, faithful to the Lord. And I think, what exactly did that look like? And I looked through these books and I found these three, like these three pillars in the books of First Chronicles and Second Chronicles that seem to describe what it means to be faithful to the Lord. But I just want to give you one. I just want to give you one. The one thing that was consistent when they were being faithful to the Lord, and if you're, con- you know, if you're taking notes, if you're writing this down, you can write this down, is, is seeking and inquiring of God. And I just thought, you know, as I was getting ready today, I just thought, you know, here, here, here you guys have had this amazing experience. We're right here at the beginning of the year. And I believe we can have revival in our heart all the way to the end of the year. I don't, I don't believe, I don't believe it has to be just these five days or these six days or these 21 days of prayer and fasting. And you know, there are different ex, you know, experiences that you have and spiritual experiences. But I believe, I believe we can be faithful to the Lord all year. I think 2013, we, we're not just having an awakening right here at the beginning of the year, but we can live throughout the whole year with this awakening in our hearts and in our minds, being faithful to the Lord. But listen, here's what it's going to mean. It's going to mean seeking and inquiring of God. It's going to mean seeking and inquiring of God. Okay, so let's take that one phrase, seeking and inquiring of God, and let's pull it apart. And and here's the first one, seeking. Seeking. And I know one of celebrations great verses that you, it's like a key verse, it's a life verse for this church, is seek first the kingdom of God. And so what does seeking mean? Seeking God, seeking God, it does mean praying. It's prayer. Seeking God is, it does mean reading your Bible. Sure. It means going to church. All those things. But you know what seeking really means? It means pursuing God. It means the spirit of your life is all about pursuing him. You're pursuing God. Your life, the motivation of your heart and the direction of your life is all about seeking God. Pursuit. Everybody say pursuit. Pursuit. So this year, this August, my wife and I, Leslie, will celebrate 23 years of marriage. 23 years. Pretty awesome. And we have a pretty amazing story because we grew up in the same neighborhood. We were in kindergarten together. We didn't date in kindergarten, but we were. We were in kindergarten together. We went to the same elementary school, and we had the same kind of pack of friends. Our parents lived three blocks apart growing up. And uh, so we were friends. But then there came a day, unlike any other day, when I began to see her in a different way. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so, so like you do when you're in eighth grade, I had my people call her people. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I had my people call her people. I wanted to see. I put some feelers out there. And there was a little resistance. I have to be honest, there was a little resistance because we were such good friends. And so so she finally we talked about it. She came and said, you know what, John, we're such good friends. I hate to ruin our friendship. And I said, baby, (laughs) baby, let us sacrifice our friendship on the altar of romance. 
And I didn't really say that, but I imagined myself saying that, and it's a good line. I kept pursuing. It took a little while, but she finally agreed to go out, and we went on a date in my Ford Fairmont. Two-tone, white Ford Fairmont with a tan top. Man, it was hot. Let me tell you, in case you don't know what a Ford Fairmont is, that about sums it up right there. Okay, now listen. So I had heard that she loved old movies. She loved old movies. So I found out that there was a Jimmy Stewart movie playing at an old theater, and so we're in the car, and I said, I thought we would go see an old movie because I love old movies. <laughs> Me too. You love old movies? Yeah, I love old movies. 